Last year I was hiking in Shenandoah, Virginia. It was a planned two-day hiking trip, myself and two friends. Late into the first day, one of my friends grew ill and decided to turn back. The second friend joined him, just in case it got worse. They told me to go on and seeing as I had been looking forward to the trip, I did. As evening approached, I came upon a clearing in the forest. On a table, surrounded by tools and several cans of spray paint, was an elaborate dollhouse. It was large, perhaps three feet tall. Its walls and windows were open, as if it had just been built and was drying. That lingering smell of spray paint still hung in the air around it. On the back of the house, a photo had been affixed. It was a family picture, old, perhaps taken in the 80s. Everyone in the picture looked very uncomfortable, like they didn't want to have their picture taken, or were forced to. Not scared, just very uncomfortable. I left it and continued on so that I might reach my planned campsite by nightfall. The wind had picked up considerably. In the distance, I heard a branch give and fall, crashing to the forest floor, startling me. I found my campsite but was a bit unnerved by the dollhouse in the middle of nowhere. I realized I didn't want to camp out in the open where whoever was working on it might stumble upon me. I had one of those little one-person tents that stand just tall enough for a person to lay down in. I set it up behind a bush, one side blocked off by a tall stand of rocks. I was glad for this, because not only was I now hidden, but the rocks effectively blocked the heavy winds, which had now turned cold. As the frigid air tumbled down from the mountains at night, the sound of the wind-churned forest was relaxing, and I think I fell asleep right away. Have you ever been woken up by a loud sound, and you're unsure what it is exactly, but some of it echoes in your mind for a moment after waking? That's what happened to me some time later in the pitch darkness of night. I had the sensation that someone was near. I listened intently trying to hear over the wind. I heard a man's voice somewhere in the distance, harsh, rapid, then becoming softer. He was too far away for me to discern what he was saying, but close enough that I could hear inflection and cadence. It sounded like a crazy person scalding himself, then his voice becoming softer, as I listened, his voice grew louder and louder until I could hear his clumsy footsteps crashing towards me. He walked by where I was camped, just several feet away from the bush that concealed me. By now, my eyes had adapted somewhat to the pale moonlight, but I still couldn't make out anything more than a large, massive shape. He was probably about six foot six, heavily built. He was carrying something long beneath his arm, a rolled up tent, I guessed. He was angrily talking about someone's face and how it haunted him. His voice then became childlike and his conversation with himself turned to the topic of cheese and crackers. The dude was clearly off his rocker that or high on something real good. After a moment, he continued on, his voice receding until I could no longer hear him. I slept a little that night afterward. At the first sight of light, I booked it back the way I came. I noted that the dollhouse was not in the clearing when I passed by. Whoever that stranger in the night was, I'm glad we did not meet. I've been reading stories on here for a while now and figured I'd post my own. I had to get my brother to help recount this. I was 12 at the time and scared shitless as a result. This happened about 
six years ago, as I stated. I was about 12, and my brother was 26 at the time. My brother had been serving in the U.S. Army for several years when this happened, and he was deployed to the Middle East on his second deployment, if I remember correctly. Also of note was that he is a Green Beret and had recently, three or four months prior to this trip, completed the Army Special Forces Qualification Course. And by then, he was an active duty SF engineer sergeant. Definitely not someone you want to fuck around with. Given that we both grew up with a passion for the outdoors, he thought it would be nice to take me on a backpacking trip in northern Alabama. And that was before he left for nine months. The trip had gone smoothly up until the third night we were camping out. Around 8 p.m. we had our camp set up, eating dinner, and we're sitting by the fire talking about typical boy shit, guns, girls. For some reference, our spot was about 50 yards from a large stream and about 50 yards downhill adjacent to the large path. Our camp, the stream, and the path formed a triangle of sorts. This was summertime in Alabama, so it wasn't quite dark yet, when two guys who looked to be in their late 20s wandered up and asked if we had seen any hogs while we were hiking around. Given that this is rural Alabama, we actually had seen some farther into the wilderness area and told them so. Even though they were relatively polite, I got a seriously creepy vibe from them. It's like this dirty clothes, greasy hair, scraggly facial hair. I think they probably looked like they belonged in the movie Deliverance. They kind of hung out for a few minutes, maybe a little longer than they should have, looking around, asking us questions like how long we had been out there and how long we are staying and what looked like them kind of sizing us up. Then they abruptly said goodbye and walked away. I didn't necessarily feel threatened by them, and I know for sure my brother didn't, but I still felt uneasy about the whole thing. Fast forward three or four hours. My brother and I had gone to sleep, and we were nestled in our tent when I woke to the sound of multiple dogs barking. I've always been a heavy sleeper, and they sounded like they were only about a hundred yards away. My heart immediately started pounding, and I kicked my brother through my sleeping bag and asked if he was awake and he heard the dogs. He responded, I'm awake. They've been getting closer for the past hour or so. Just lay still and don't make any sounds. Needless to say, 12-year-old me was about to shit my pants. We would also hear sporadic shouts from several different sources, but neither came any closer. A few minutes later, my brother whispered, They're just hunting for hogs. They use hogs to pin them down and then they shoot them. This gave me some relief, but not much. Somehow, I managed to fall back asleep. The fact that they were doing this at night was a huge red flag, my brother later told me, but I think he was trying just to keep me calm. Fast forward what was probably another three hours, around 2 a.m., I had managed to sleep pretty well after first hearing the hog hunters when I woke up to my brother squeezing my shoulder firmly saying, wake up, put your shoes on quick and follow me, be as quiet as you can. My heart immediately went back to racing because I heard the dogs and the voices in the distance, farther away than before but still distinct. Not asking any questions, I did what he said and as soon as we were out of the tent he told me to get on his back. Well, this was a breeze for him, after rucking with God knows how much weight in the army. We snuck about 50 yards into the woods towards the junction of the path and the stream and crawled into some bushes. It was up a hill, so we had a pretty good elevated view of our campsite. I remember as we were laying there how loudly I was breathing and how quiet he was when I heard the very distinct sound of a pistol slide racking. I looked over and my brother had his pistol and was watching the campsite and surrounding area. I started to whisper to him when he put his hand over my mouth and pointed at the campsite. The group of hunters had been steadily approaching our camp and by this time had reached it. There were five of them and like three or four dogs. They all looked relatively young but two had either rifles or shotguns and the dogs were going crazy, obviously having smelled our scent. 
For those of you who are backpackers or campers, nobody who comes up on a random campsite in the middle of the night with dogs and guns has good intentions. I knew this. And my brother knew this. I was scared shitless. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but my brother later told me they were talking about us, although he hadn't heard any specifics either. They lingered for about 20 minutes, shining flashlights around and talking to themselves, when my brother put his mouth to my ear and said, If they come towards us, I want you to turn and run as quickly as you can. Don't stop, don't look back. Stay off the trail and look for the flashlights. I didn't know what he meant by this, but that'll come later. He then handed me a flashlight and told me not to take the red filter off. He told me later that the red filter helps preserve night vision and cuts down ambient light so it would be harder for someone to see him from a distance. At this point, I was so scared, I almost started crying, but at the same time had a rush of adrenaline and what I think now was confidence that he thought I could handle myself. We laid there for a while, longer, when out of nowhere, they started screaming, Where are y'all at? And firing into the woods at random. My brother dragged me back behind the crest of the hill and threw himself on top of me. Thankfully, our position on the top of the hill, we were protected from any gunfire. They shot maybe five or six more times and then started walking back the direction they had come. They got maybe a hundred yards away when I heard a blaring siren and saw emergency lights flashing through the woods. Turns out my brother had called the Forest Service office on a satellite phone my family has for emergencies while I was asleep, and they had sent out a Forest Service officer and game wardens to our area in the wilderness. The Sipsi Wilderness is about 25,000 acres in size, so it took them a while to get there on the dirt roads. When we saw the game warden truck, my brother signaled them with the light and pointed them in the direction the hunters had gone, and the guy sped off, shining his spotlight through the woods. As soon as they were all gone, we went back to our camp, packed up our shit, and waited by the path for the game warden to come back, who then gave us a ride in his truck. On the drive back, my brother told me how brave I had been and that we would talk about it with our parents the next day if I wanted to. I asked him not to do that because I thought they might never let me go to camp again. So creepy rednecks in the woods, let's not meet again. You might get shot next time. Here's a follow-up of this story. We never got any definitive information on what happened to the rednecks we encountered. I have many friends who have gone out to Sipsy area and had a great time with no creepy stuff going on. However, it is truly a wilderness area and law enforcement response would be slow. I was lucky that my brother was there and reacted so quickly. Who knows what could have happened? We also got lucky that whatever their intentions were, they were either reconsidering or lost interest. I will note that when they left our camp, the game warden showed up pretty soon afterwards, but I didn't see what the guys and their dogs did. If I remember correctly, they headed in a direction parallel to the stream, away from the trail, inaccessible to any kind of vehicle. Maybe the warden continued on and took another trail to try to cut them off? We waited around 30 minutes for him to come back, and he said there were other officers out looking. There are only so many paths that you could take a truck or quad bike, so any thorough search effort would also have to be done on foot. This happened to a friend of mine a few years ago when he and his wife were hiking in Queensland, Australia. After a good day's hike, they stopped at a rest stop to use the bathroom before heading back to the car. The bathrooms at the rest stop were compost toilets, so a block of toilets were positioned on top of a large tank. The waste goes in the tank and breaks down naturally. My friend's wife went to use the ladies' room while he waited outside, but she'd not been in there long when he heard her scream and rush out of the toilet. It's Australia, so there are many reasons for running out of a bush toilet screaming. But this one takes the cake. There's a man in the toilet! My friend was confused. 
His wife explained to him that she'd been gone to the loo and after she'd finished, she looked into the tank and there submerged in liquid poop, she saw a man staring up at her. He didn't believe her, but she was adamant. He go look, so he went into the ladies and with the flashlight from his iPhone, he illuminated the poop pool to get a better look. He couldn't see anything, but she was certain it was someone hiding in the tank watching people use the toilet. As they were leaving and still arguing about it, they were approached by a man. Excuse me, but did you see something weird in the toilet? My friend's wife answered, yes. The man replied, was it a man? He and his girlfriend had been hiking the weekend before and his girlfriend had seen the same thing. They all ran back up to the toilets for a second look. When they reached the door, they heard a sound from behind the toilet block. My friend and their new acquaintance went around the back of the toilet block to check it out while his wife looked in the tank from the bowl. At the back of the tank, the top hatch had been open, the bolt and chain had been removed, and a telltale brown smudge seemed to suggest someone had slid down the back of the tank and taken off into the bush. Both my friend and his wife swear the story is true and they're not prone to making up crazy stories. Needless to say, it has made me think twice before using compost campsite toilet. So if you're still out there, poo man, let's not meet. A couple of summers ago, my girlfriend and I were camping in Chiquan Meguan National Forest in northern Wisconsin. And after our experience, we do not plan to return unless we go with a large group of people. My girlfriend and I are from Chicago, so northern Wisconsin was our go-to place for R&R. We've done a number of hiking trips in northern Wisconsin, but never to this area. We are not backpacking experts but we have been to a number of national parks and have been out hiking and exploring when we can find time away from work. We love getting away from people and relaxing in nature, but this trip made us appreciate the presence of other people around us in unfamiliar places. Our plan was to hike a remote section of the North Country Trail. The North Country Trail is a national scenic trail like the Appalachian Trail, but it gets much less use. In some parts of northern Wisconsin, the trail is very remote and the only access is via logging roads. We plan to hike 15 miles along the trail to a backpack shelter, spend the night, and hike back to the car the following day. We spent the night at a friend's house in Wassa and we set out early the next day to the trailhead. As we entered the National Forest boundary, we were captivated by the beauty of the thick green forest. I drove slowly along the gravel logging roads as we made our way to our parking spot. While we were driving to the trailhead, we passed a couple of people standing next to a parked truck on the side of the road. They appeared to be hillbillies, as they had rusted out, banged up pickup truck, complete with Confederate bumper stickers. As we drove past, I waved, and they stared back without returning the greeting. Friendly people, I thought to myself. After we passed them, I looked in the rearview mirror and noticed they were still staring at us. And before we rounded a bend, I glanced back into the mirror again and saw them watching us through the haze of road dust. My girlfriend and I joked about the up north people, but we did not think anything of the encounter. Aside from those people, we did not encounter anyone else on the remote logging roads within the National Forest boundary. We found the trailhead about 15 minutes later, after winding our way on the narrow logging road. There was no one else parked at the trailhead, a perfect chance to get some much needed solitude, fresh air, and relaxation. 
After parking and making sure the car was locked, we hoisted our backpacks and set off on the trail. The weather was relatively cool, which thankfully kept the mosquitoes and biting flies at bay. We took pictures along the way, and we marveled at the lusciousness of the forest and how peaceful it was. After a solid eight hours of hiking, we found our campsite. It consisted of a wooden backpack shelter and a fire ring. Even though the shelter provided enough space for us, we opted to set up our tent in a small clearing about a hundred feet behind the shelter. We built a fire at the shelter fire ring, and I boiled water for our food. As we ate, we watched the sky slowly turn dark. My girlfriend and I passed around a bottle filled with wine, and we marveled at how many stars you could see away from the city. When the fire was reduced to a small pile of glowing ambers, we decided to head back to the tent. We settled into our tent and looked through the pictures we took that day, but after lugging a heavy backpack for 15 miles and drinking some wine, I was ready for some shut-eye. When we camped at state and national parks, I usually wore earplugs, but that night, there was no RVs or other campers to make any noise, so I closed my eyes and let the noise of the forest lullaby me to sleep. My girlfriend was very uneasy that night, but she was normally apprehensive whenever we were sleeping away from home. I'm not sure when we drifted to sleep, but we awoke to a bone-chilling noise. It was pitch black outside, and over the sound of the insects in the forest, I heard a dull thud. It sounded like someone was hitting two logs together. My girlfriend and I were wide awake at this point, and we lay silently in our tent hearing the noise again. Our old tent had windows, but the backpacking tent we were using had no windows. We could only guess at what was making the noise outside our tent. We initially thought that an animal got at our food and garbage bag, which we left in the shelter, but the noise was too distinct and it did not sound like rustling through food wrappers or our camp equipment. Our hearts were pounding as we heard the persistent knock in the darkness. Unarmed and scared shitless, we did not know what to do. I would normally have carried a can of bear spray, but I decided to leave it at home to save on weight. The knocking sound continued, but we remained still as to not give away our location. For all we knew, whatever was making the noise had already spotted our tent. After what seemed like an eternity, the knocking sound ceased. We lay in complete silence with only the dull buzz of the insects in the background. Then we heard it, leaves rustling, a branch breaking, voices. We heard low talking in the distance. We could not make out what was being said, but it sounded like a couple of people talking. The voices continued for a bit, but to our relief, the voices did not seem to be getting louder. Whoever was out there did not spot the tent or decided to leave us alone. We sat in our tent for the rest of the night, adrenaline surging through our veins. At the first sight of light, we slowly got out of the tent. I looked around in all directions to see if anyone was out there, but I only saw the forest and the backpack shelter. We quickly rolled up our sleeping bags and camp pads and put our tent away. When we got to the shelter, my girlfriend screamed in horror. On the entrance to the shelter, the wood was freshly cut, the word kill was cut into the shelter wall and there was a number of axe and knife cuts where someone was chopping at the wall. I looked at the ground and saw a scattering of fresh wood splinters. After grabbing our food supply and garbage bag, we got the hell out of there. We were nearly jogging with our gear as we made our way back to the car. I kept glancing back over my shoulder and gazing out through the woods to see if anyone was following us. 
We traversed through the glacial eskers that we saw the day before, and we knew we were getting close to our car. We were quietly rejoicing as we were nearing the trailhead. We made it back to the trailhead in near record time, but something was wrong. The windshield wiper on my car was sticking straight up and there was something stuck in the wiper. As we inched closer to the car, I saw there was blood smeared on the windshield and a squirrel carcass was impaled on the wiper blade. Hair and blood still stuck on the wiper and on the hood of the car. I didn't bother cleaning off the car. We threw our gear in the trunk and I sped off without removing the animal from the wiper blade. As I sped down the gravel logging road, I kept glancing in the rear view mirror, but I could not see anything through the cloud of road dust behind the car. When we got to a gas station, I removed the carcass with a wad of newspaper and I tried to remove as much dried up blood as I could. I filled up on gas and we didn't stop until we made it to Milwaukee. This was the last trip I took to the woods of northern Wisconsin. Hey my nightmare army, thank you all for watching and if you enjoyed this video make sure to hit that subscribe button and join the nightmare army. I'm always looking for new soldiers in my nightmare nation. As always, thank you Fort Stories for helping me on my Collab Tuesday video. And if you guys haven't, please check out Fort Stories' channel. I definitely think you guys will like her. And if you're in need of any horror, I'm pretty sure she can help you out with that. And uh, just on a little ending note, guys, I kind of want to keep this a uh, little bit short here. Uh, this Friday coming up, I do want to do a creepypasta video. However, I want to know, guys, do you guys want a creepypasta or do you guys want a no-sleep story? Whichever one you guys pick, write down in the comments below and I will be sure to read them. And as always guys, thank you all for watching, and just remember, the best ideas always come out of nightmares.